Um, so good afternoon and once again, thank you all for coming. And I'd like to open my presentation with a question for all of you. I'm sort of assuming that most everybody's going to raise their hand. I'm wondering how many of you have used Google Translate at least once? Maybe a few yes. times? Yeah, I thought so. And how many have, as a part of that experience, gotten results that you knew didn't make sense? Yeah. <laughs> that were at least slightly off, if not actually skewed to the point of absurdity. <laughs> so let's leave a show of hands for slightly off. Skewed to the point of absurdity? Skewered? Yeah. <laughs> OK. All right. So most of you probably don't have your phones with you, right? <laughs> but if you do have your phone with you, um, and you can easily bring up Google Translate, I want to suggest an experiment. And if you can't do it or you don't feel like it, I'll tell you the results that I got in any event. Um, and the sentence that I'm going to ask you to put in is actually on the top of the handout, the first page of the handout that I just had, that uh, Meryl just kindly distributed. So if you want to put that sentence in, it, to, there was a big to-do about all the tall tales he tried to put over on his audience. Did you get one? Okay, thank you. Um, so there was a big to-do about all the tall tales he tried to put over on his audience. Now, if you know French, then you've already noticed, presumably, that Google misses the point. Um, and if you set Google Translate back to French to English, and take the French sentence and put that in there if you can, and see what you get. And my own results were as follows. In the English to French yielded, il y avait, pardon my translation, il y avait un gros travail à faire sur tous les grands comptes qu'il tentait de transmettre à son public. And what I got when I took it from French back into English was, there was a lot of work to do on all the great tales he was trying to convey to his audience. So thanks to Google Translate, he, whoever he was, went from being a lying scoundrel trying to hoodwink his audience to being a guy who was just trying to tell some wonderful stories with his listeners who were apparently, and try to get some worlds of wonderful stories across with his listeners who were apparently not bright enough to understand. Now, I could put up a little political slant on this, but I think I won't. <laughs> so, um, why am I asking you to put Google, the language like this into Google Translate? It's asking a lot of Google. The first sentence that the, the sentence that I first proposed, we could enter as there was a big fuss about all the lies he tried to tell his audience. And guess what? Surprise, surprise. Google does a much better job when you rephrase the sentence that way. Why? Because it dispenses with strongly idiomatic language or idiomatic English expressions like to do and tall tales and put over on, which are the rocks that scuttle Google's ship. So why bother with idiomatic? Does everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, why bother with the idiomatic language in the first place? Well, a couple of ways of looking at that. I happen to think life is more interesting when you don't have to make boring statements like, this is the kind of thing Google can't handle. And instead, you can talk in metaphors about rocks, scuttling ships, and so forth. But if you paid attention to the title of this talk, I'm sure you all did, and you know that, of course, what we're talking about here is not workaday translation, but literary translation, and literature is full of figurative language. And by the way, as a sort of mischievous side note here, while I was working on this presentation, I had a sudden impulse to take Philip Larkin's very famous poem, This Be the Verse, and run the same experiment on that, put it in for French, and then bring it back to English. I'm not, don't, please don't do it now. <laughs> We'd like you to pay attention to us right now. Uh, but if you decide to do it later, you may find the result amusing, possibly scandalous, depending on how easily shocked you are. Anyway, moving on. My own work involves translating Arabic literature into English. Mostly I do contemporary fiction, but I've worked with classical poetry as well. You see an example on the handout that I just, that we just distributed. And drawing on some of that material for my own experience, experiments with Google Translate has been illuminating. What I'm going to share with you now is just a few lines from a poem by Abu Nuwes. You have it on the handout there. A prolific poet of Iraqi and Persian origin who lived in the 8th and 9th centuries. The poem that I'm using is known as Iblis or Abu Nuwes, or The Devil and Abu Nuwes. And the gist of it is that poor lovelorn Abu Nuwes has been dumped by his sweetheart 
and he calls on the devil and says, yo, Satan, you better give me back my beloved, because if you don't, I'm going to stop being a dissolute, carousing drunk and become the best Muslim you ever saw. So apparently the devil hears him, and because the next thing you know, Abu Nuwais' sweetheart appears and asks him for forgiveness. So the opening four lines of the poem, I'm going to give them to you in Arabic just so you can hear how they sound, and then in the most literal, not literary, English translation I could come up with, and then in Google Translate's rendition, and finally in my own literary translation, which of course is subjective, and based on particular criteria that another translator might not use at all. So here's the Arabic, just the first four lines. You've got the whole thing on your handout. لما جثاني الحبيب وامتنعت عني الرسالات منه والخبر اشتد شوقي فكاد يقتلني ذكر حبيبي والهم والفكر دعوت إبليس ثم قلت له في خلوة والدموع تنهمر أما ترى كيف قد بليت وقد أقرح جفني البكاء والسهر And it goes on. So, you, uh, the the uh, non-literary interlinear translation preserves the original word order in so far as possible. That's what you actually have in front of you for the whole poem. And classical Arabic has a way of putting the verb before its subject, so keep this in mind. It's going to sound a little like Yoda, <laughs> you know, with the, the Yoda's inverted syntax. So, when left me the beloved, and were forbidden to me the letters from him and the news, intensified my longing and was about to kill me, the memory of my beloved and the worry and the thinking. I summoned the devil, then said to him in privacy, and the tears were coursing down, don't you see how I have been afflicted and how has inflamed my eyelid the weeping and the sleeplessness? Now, I do realize this may actually sound a bit like Google Translate getting up to its tricks. So unless you happen to know Arabic, I'll just have to ask you to take my word for it that the foregoing, even though its syntax may sound like Yoda, is actually a lot more accurate than what you're about to hear, which is the English version that Google Translate gave me when I fed it these lines over the weekend. So Google Translate gave me... When my beloved healed me and the messages and news from him abstained from me. What? <laughs> My longing intensified and almost killed me mentioning my beloved illusion and thought. I called Satan and told him in retreat with tears pouring down, do you see how it has worn out? I have been crying and crying out. This kind of fades in and out like a bad radio signal. There are phrases that are spot on, such as my longing intensified, that's accurate. Other bits are wrong in ways I can't even begin to understand. For the word Jafeni, which means he shunned me. Google appears to have arbitrarily substituted another Arabic word altogether, Shafeni, which sounds a bit similar but starts with a completely different letter and means he healed me. Bit of a discrepancy. So, so finally, and there, there's some more of that going on, which I'll mention in a moment. So finally, what I did with the poem when preparing a translation of it for publication, you actually have that on the second side as well. Um, and I've just got the first four lines here. When I was forsaken by my lover, his letters ceased, I found no consolation. Half mad with longing, plagued by memories, I very nearly died of my obsession. I called the devil for a private word, and in a flood of tears revealed my anguish. Behold my sore affliction, ravaged eyes, for I can only weep and sleepless languish. Now, I made some decisions about how to do this based on my desire to do it in meter and rhyme. I didn't try to follow the, the particular method of meter and rhyme that, that Arabic uses. I did something that was a little bit more familiar to English readers. And again, those are arbitrary decisions. But um, in doing that, I, I did take some liberties, you know, considerable liberties here and there. But um, like the idea, uh, the line about the beloved, let's see, news of the beloved ceased, I've substituted there, I found no consolation. And for the memory of my beloved was about to kill me, I've rendered plagued by memories, I very nearly died of my obsession. So if I've strayed that far from the original, how can I argue that my version is better than Google Translate? Well, I do argue that, actually. But for one thing, my version makes sense, I think, I hope. Google's doesn't, for the most part. And for another, I'd like to think that my version has some artistic merit. 
I submit to you that I found no consolation is preferable, both semantically and aesthetically, to news from him abstained from me, which doesn't make any sense at all if you ask me. Uh, and I maintain the same could be said of plagued by memories. I very nearly died of my obsession in preference to almost killed me mentioning my beloved illusion and thought. The Arabic there, incidentally, doesn't actually say anything about illusion. That's another thing that just crept in there from somewhere. It seems to have been an arbitrary substitution with Arabic wehm, meaning fanciful thought or delusion, apparently replacing hem, they added a whole other letter, which signifies care or worry. Why, why Google Translate does this, I don't know. I don't know how algorithms work, but in the present case, I'd say not very well. So. Um, my point, what is my point? My point is that we literary translators aren't going anywhere, at least not anytime soon. I certainly hope we're not. There'll be props for us for a while yet. Um, and that's unless readers of translated literature are prepared to make do with stuff like Google Translate's rather worrisome treatment of a famous poem by the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish. Um, the poem is Rita and the Rifle. It's understood to be about star-crossed lovers on either side of the Palestinian-Israeli divide. And let's hear from Google. Just the first eight lines, I think, will suffice as an illustration. So this is what I got over the weekend when I put this in here. Between Rita and my gun eyes, and who knows Rita bends, he prays Lale in honey eyes, and I accepted Rita when she was young. I remember how I got stuck. Me covered my forearm with the sweetest pigtail. Now, would you buy a book if it had that sort of stuff in it? Here's one rendition of what this poem actually says. And this is my own translation, which I, I suspect it's been better done by other translators, but here's mine for now anyway. There's a rifle between Rita and my gaze. Whoever knows Rita kneels and prays to a god in her honey eyes. I kissed Rita when she was young. I remember how she clung to me and her hair so sweetly braided covered my forearm. So in, the, in Google's version, it took the word that means to a god and turned it into a woman's name, some imaginary woman's name, Lolly. And I, I kissed Rita, came out, I accepted Rita. And I know why this happened. It happened because Arabic has... There are, there's, there are words that can be spelled precisely the same, differentiated, if you don't know the context well enough, differenti differentiated by a diacritic. And the diacritics make no difference to Google Translate. You can put them in and it doesn't change anything. So that's what happened there. The word for I kissed is qabaltu, and there's a little symbol on the middle letter. Qabaltu would be I accepted. So that's what happened there. I don't know what happened with to a god. So... Although I would suggest that probably this might, the translation of that, I, I, I just kind of whipped that out, that it has been better done, in, or at least could be better done, but maybe not by Google, by quite some. So I rest my case. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Thank you for coming. So, this is my uh, experience uh, translating uh, Japanese uh, literature into English, especially Japanese poem. It goes Waka. I did uh, several books, and this is one of the books we faced with my American colleagues who do together project. So this is my talk. What's the matter with Google? Translation is a human activity. Waka means Japanese short poem. Uh, what is lost in translation? That's my thing. So I'd like to show you very, you never heard about Japanese hundred poems, uh, you know, written by hundred poets. 
you can see this is a women's voice, well, very high pitch voice. By Emperor Tenji. By Emperor Jito. This is a female emperor. See, this is a very uh, female voice, high pitch. It's uh, different from the male uh, readers. So this is uh, like a, uh, some pictures from the previous 100 or like a 14th, 15th centuries, or be, you know, or like 900. This is a still written record about Japanese poem by aristocrat or royal families. They still keep this copy. So I'd like to mention uh, one of the famous poets, uh, Kino Tsuruyuki wrote, saying that the poetry of Japan has its root in the human heart and flourishes in the country's leaves of words. It is in the poetry that they give expressions to the meditations of their hearts in terms of the sights appearing before their eyes and the sounds coming to their ears. Hearing the warbler sing among the blossoms and the frog in their fresh waters. Is there any living being not given to song? Also, the song means waka, has meant it, it is a poem in 31 syllables arranged in five lines of five, seven, five, seven, seven syllables, respectively. So what is waka? It is a short poem, maybe the shortest poem in the world uh, with specific structural uh, requirements written to express feelings. Feelings. There's a song, feelings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a famous song. It differs from poetry in Western tradition, both in form and in influence. Throughout its history, the waka has had an importance in Japanese society unparalleled in the West. So there is another general difference. Over the centuries, waka were written more to capture emotions, feelings, than to explain or define them. In contrast, more like Western poetry has been concerned with the reasons, logical reasons, for the particular feeling as well as the emotion itself. It has told stories, created allegories, and even discussed theology. So both the Japanese poem has traditionally treated the what rather than why of experience and opened the wealth of subtle emotions to us. So when we read the Japanese poetry in translation, sometimes the syllables count seems wrong. One reason is that Japanese words often cannot be translated by single equivalent word in English. Secondly, English poetic forms are not usually based on syllables, but on stress. Thirdly, Japanese poems rely on internal rhythms and the sounds of their effect, but English poems often use rhyme. So the translator, even while maintaining a syllabic count and uh, lineation, must also try to find words which scan 
at least to some degree like English poetry. <coughs> so in fact, it is doubtful that any Japanese waka can be literally translated in English due to the stark structural differences between the two languages. This is a task I can. I, I brought my translation. This is in Japanese. It took about four, four years. And this, this is a English translation. You can take a look later. So in my presentation, I show some examples of the waka translated English by both American and Japanese translators, as well as Google translation. You're going to see very interesting result. And point out and discuss some of the decisions they had to make on doing the translation. So one of my colleagues who involved the translation with me about this eight female emperors of Japan. We had a lot of discussions, positive argument. And then she mentioned that one of the uh, truism of translation is that every translation is interpretation. And the comparison of poems by these translators is additional evidence of that even when the translator's understanding of the meaning of the original is essentially the same, the English versions are usually very different poems. So this is a two America. Even the Americans make sure the differences. On the left side, original waka by Kokin Wakashu say, Tsuremo naki, hito wo ya netaku, chiratsuyu no, so this is Rod Hickinson's translation. That man I'm feeling as a transparent dew on the morning grass. Why am I so pledged awake? I grieve asleep. I yearn for him. This is my close translation. I know both of my colleagues. Rising as rises, the white dew. Ought I to sigh, seeking sleep to yearn, half vexing to be so moved by one who cares nothing for me? You see the difference? Even the same American professional PhD translators. So, the Waka translation, McLaw is committed to staying close to the Jap original Japanese version. But Roth and Hawkins are already uh, literally experimenting with creative poems in English. By omitting punctuation and manipulating the typography, the work seems to be more committed to the English version, and their translation are often surprisingly literal. So I'm going to mention a little bit uh, I just using a PowerPoint, so that means you follow my talk. This is another issue. English, my third language. Original Japanese, second language, French. English, my third. So that means you can follow me. I hope a couple, most of you speak two well, third languages. <laughs> so, so it's so appropriate to translate fact such as science or history with direct translation. However, when translating a poetic form such as waka, various background information needs to be taken into consideration, such as social, political background, climate, tradition, culture, daily life habit, national characters, so forth. So it is really included behind the scene. On top of that, each translator has their own personal style when translating waka. Okay? Also, we have to pay attention to makura kotoba. It's called the pillow words. So this is a sort of a translation I'd like to share with you. Uh, original Japanese left, and then my colleague's translation, and our translation, and the Google translation. I speak Japanese, so I go to the American translation. Awaiting my beloved in the raindrops 
on the foot wearing mountain, I stand being soaked in the dripping mountain rain. The Japanese translator who, who is PhD in English, okay? <laughs> I waited for you in the rain at the foot of the mountain and got soaked in the mountain rain. On the right side by Google's. Ashihi, this is interesting. Ashihi no to keep the mountain to wait for my sister to get wet. This is amazing. So the interpretation is so different. Okay. Because the main point is always poet, feelings and emotions including. But Google does not, you know, translate the feelings and emotions. So this is a pro and the cons of Google translation. So pros, Google Translate is free, translate is quick, translate uses a, so a statistical method to form an online translation database based on language pair frequency. <laughs> and this is a cons. Google Translate, the meaning can be lost in translation because, I'm sorry, I cannot see it. There is not you know, way to incorporate context. The quality of a translation, it depends on the language pair. Google Translate often produces translations that contain significant grammatical errors. So Google Translate does not have a system to correct the translation errors. So this is a conclusion. Google does not translate the poets, feelings and emotions. I hope in the future it will be improved. Thank you very much. And uh, audience and uh, library staff, thank you very much for joining us and uh, you know for the panel discussion. Of course, my and the talk is also about the translation. So the translation, I give the questions here. So creation, art, or skill. So I take the three questions as a case studies through my translation class. I. Teaches, uh, I teach one class called the Translation in History in Chinese, you know. So this course and uh, the divided two parts. One is uh, we do the, the translation theory and uh, also the translation history in China. The second part, we took uh, one poem, the selection of the poem, which has to do the translation. So the, today I'm gonna talk about the second part, how I take the case studies of the students through the translation to compare to the Google's Google translation. So what happened? And before we talk about that, and I want to first introduce our one science fiction and uh, novella. Now, as uh, uh, you, you see, and this is a very famous and Chinese science fiction writer, and if you see the movie called A Wandering Earth, it's adapting from his uh, novel. And uh, Obama is a big fan of him. The book about uh, the three-body problem is excellent uh, science fiction novel. But uh, today, I'm going to talk about is a novella is uh, about uh, Chinese called Shi Yun. It's a cloud of uh, the poetry. I just introduce uh, fast because the time limited. And the first is uh, only for the board Olan. And the time unclear, but uh, far away in the future, of course. And stage Earth. Remember the Earth is a horror and all the human beings are raised by the divera intellectual intelligent uh, dinosaurs. That's the fiction, okay? <laughs> and, uh, that's, and there were things, fun, funny things about uh, the three and the uh, men and protests. The one is E, 
he is a, a human being, a poet who teaches a human, human beings a classical poem, especially Chinese poem called Tang Shi, and the classical poem. The way is a, 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 da ya, a message from the diverious state, a four dimensional space. Then we remember that. And also the last one called Li Bai, who comes from a more 11 dimensional space. So we know that. And the author and have the idea in the future, Google is definitely concurred. All the translation be possible. So this novel and the talk about the story is translation is possible even each of the small things. But the, also the novelist mentioned about that. Could really even this guy living in the 11 dimension the space can transform poem. And uh, now I'm just go. Oh, what what happened? Okay. I and uh, escape just a couple of lines to to talk about their dialogue, their argument. So the the intelligent uh, and uh, dinosaur said, he said, I would not understand why human being who has a poor technology, but is still fascinated by uh, art, of course, including poem. So the, the Li Bai, he said, uh, technology could go beyond everything, including making poetry. And the last, uh, the human being will say it, art has nothing to do with the technology because the true art must be created through the essence of the human spiritual world, which cannot be surpassed by any technology. Basically, technology is anti-poetic. Now, the, the, we know the, the basic term. Technology is anti-poetic, so the translation is impossible. I'm going to the class, okay? And the for the class, and uh, I realized that we have uh, three stages to teach students to translate uh, the, the point. The first one, learning, is a skill. Definitely we can do. We teach uh, vocabulary, grammar, a sentence structure. It's no problem. Machine can do it. AI definitely must it better than us. The second one is understanding. Understanding is our culture barrier. And uh, when I ask a student to translate the poem, later we show you that. The, the poem called, I only want make a one case study, okay, if I have so many. They talk about uh, love is like a cup of tea. A student sit there and say, say, Professor, why love is like a cup of tea, not a roses? I say, now that is a culture differences. And uh, roses and uh, for China, and uh, in the classical China, in the ancient China, feudal China, roses, the love, like a passionate, I think it's a roses, is red, passionate, and romantic, right? Only modern China, we learn from a Western society. We first time we know what is a romantic love. Before that, there's nothing like that. Tea, then I say that, I put the couples before on the table, put the tea on the table and put the hot water into it. I say, smile it. They say, mmm, sweet, very lightly. And I say, that is love in the ancient China and for the people, especially they think about innocent love. And this is idea. So then that's what we call understanding. We can also bury this barrier from, uh, and, uh, at the class you can teach. But the last one, and we call sublimation, I was surprised. Because when I ask all the students to turn in their poem, we put on the screen, none of them the same. I know I cannot teach them that. Each student has their own culture, their own beauty, the sense of beauty. So this part, if we cannot teach, I don't think the AI can teach you too. So we, let's go to, to see the, the, the class. We'll see what they do, okay? That is a Chinese poem. And uh, let me read it in Chinese so you can enjoy a little bit of Chinese language, okay? So the Chinese call, 爱情像一杯清茶. 当你出现, 爱情就像一杯清茶. 来到身边, 在我眼里, 
，那些五颜六色的饮料，没有一种能散发永远的芳香。你笑的时候，世界仿佛已变得明亮，那拥塞的街区也变得很宽敞。我们一起走，走过繁华，去寻找传说中的古塔。在古塔浓重的阴影里，留下一个闪着金色光泽的童话。So you you see the the modern and the Chinese poems here. So this is Google. Do later we will compare to students and the, the translation. Okay. So this translation, I just choose a four students. None of the students the same. You see. Even they say about、uh, love is a cup of tea. These students, because his background is A B C student, he put a clear because the Chinese believe tea has a black tea, red tea, clear、uh, green tea, whatever kind of tea. American students say tea is a tea. Why、well, have to be clear? So the translation are different. So so that Google cannot do. Google only have a one type of translation. And we also noticed, and、uh, the 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 we read here, and the, they call Guta. Guta is what、uh, is a、uh, he translate to be a spire, and another student translate to be tower. So everybody has a different translation. Very difficult to judge who is the best, who is the less good, and because is because the people will say, I like this type. So now I came to the questions here too. That's another two students the translation, and we noticed, and they also they don't say the、uh, as you emerge. That's when you appeared. The choice, the choice make difference from a Google and with a human being. The sense is here. They may offer the best translation, but only have one kind. We are human being. I like tea. You like coffee. You like a sweet drink. We have a different a taste. That is a key. I think the Google cannot surpass of human being. So we we and that and、uh, eventually and、uh, we discussed we and、uh, talk about a lot of things and difference. Then they came out the whole class. We decided that this is our translation and、uh, for. The love is a cup of tea. So let me read that, and we go back to the Google Translate to see the differences. Okay, here is a. He said, "When you appeared, love became like a cup of tea. When you come came at my sight, when I could see you in my eyes, those other vibrate drinks, internal pervading scent." He used scent. Later, I talk about why you did not use a fragrant, and the wood shrank. When you smell, the wood is lighter, cannot be restrained. Crowded streets become open lanes, not road and street. Change again. Let's work together through the convention to find the tower within the legends. Inside the shadow of the tower, so old. We leave behind a fairy tale that shine like the gold. It's a quite a you know rhyme and nice. So we go back to the Google to see the Google translations here. Not a so much mistake and、uh, precise and、uh, accurate. No emotion. We can see that. Say when you appear, love is like a cup of tea. Come to my side in my eye. Those colorful drink, no one can give away the internal fragrance because they say fragrance. That's why I ask a student to smell the tea, open the window, do one minute and the, the meditation. Then we write. So that's different. Google use that words. These words cannot fit into tea. Then they say, "Well, your love words seems to be right too." They use a too and use a also. Those are in the poem is not beautiful. So Google in this poem did not do bad, too bad a job, but not a poetic. And uh, so, and uh, then I the students write a paper about uh, if and uh, AI can surpass human being in translation. So none of them agree with this. Then we got. 
to the conclusion. This is our conclusion. Okay, we said、uh, although AI system approve useful in many field, even surpass human being competence at a certain tasks. Translation is an undertaking that requires the skill of human being, because humans have the capacity to sense nuanced emotion as well as ability to utilize. In the translation process, their knowledge of a certain culture. In this paper, I will assert that. AI will never completely replace human being in translation. Instead, AI can serve as a tool that may assist a human in translation, such as the poem of the and、uh, Wang Guozheng. Human beings are life form with a various、uh, complicated emotion. They are complex living bodies with emotional dimensions. It is very difficult for AI to grasp the delicate, subtle. Complex, rich, and various emotion inside of the human beings. AI may be able to translate more and、uh, standardized documents, and some literary and or artistic task can be translated in the future. Hope so. However, in the field of poetry, there seems no possibility for the AI to supply human being translation. So the reason is very simple, because man is a thinking real. Thank you very much for your. I'm really going to expose myself. I use Google Translate, <laughs> but <laughs> judiciously, I, I use it sometimes just because I'm curious to see how it compares with what I've found, for instance, in the dictionary or what my own mind is telling me. But I don't necessarily take it. I don't take it at face value.、Um, I never use Google Translate unless it's for something extremely straightforward. I don't ever use it for. Without verify, verifying it, usually more than once in two different sources. And in fact, for using the dictionary, I tell my students to do the same thing. If they're if they're ever using an English to Arabic dictionary, I said you need to verify it. You need to make sure that the Arabic word you've found in the dictionary agrees with what your Arabic to English dictionary says, because you know you could get you know there are these words, of course, that can mean completely different things according to、um, the context. So, and students aren't necessarily always alert to that. So,、um, do you want to speak to that question? Uh, before I start doing a translation, I go over read、uh, in Japanese first, a couple of times. What the poem means, what it meant, what is the intention behind the authors. Then I usually look at any vocabulary. I look at dictionary first, and then I do occasionally Google, but、uh, I see the discrepancies, so I follow my own、uh, translation. Then after that. I discuss with my colleagues that、uh, this kind of a very complicated poems books. I discuss with my colleagues, both Japanese colleagues, the American colleagues, the vice versa, English Japanese. I do same way. And、uh, according to my own experiences, and I translate、uh, quite a lot of books too. And、uh, if you Google it, it, the structure just broken. You cannot rely on it, and、uh, for some fast reading, maybe you do it. If you want really want to、uh, translate a good text, you have to do everything by yourself, really, and from beginning. And that's my experiences. I did it if the Google, I how fix it the sentence because I know it's wrong. It's so difficult. So the dictionary may be better.
I have to agree with everything you said, and I only use, I've never actually used Google Translator, I use dictionaries online. Yeah, I use time. a dictionary first, Google Translator so, just once in a while. But I had a, so uh, I recently read something that was very, that kind of relates to this, that um, we now have artificial intelligence software that produces text, not literary text, not poetry, um, conference proceedings, for example. So, and the question will, has already arisen, but will come up more and more, who owns the copyright for these texts? Is this is the artificial intelligence, or the trainer who trains artificial intelligence, the human being that stands behind it. So this is gonna be a problem in the future, right? As, um, so you have copyright when you do a translation. You have your creative copyright, but what do you do with AI texts? Do you have any thoughts about this? <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yes, I was uh, surprised uh, when I translated uh, the fairy story like uh, Anderson. I think so many in China, at least uh, 25. I thought, oh, oh my gosh, I may have a, a like a look like a, someone's translation. But when I did the translation, I read other people's text, totally different. So I think that the, I mentioned that the last part, the sublimation, and uh, that part no one can teach, and each of us have its own style and bring your own personality into and your culture background and uh, your your sense about the beauty. And uh, I think, uh, yes, and uh, each of the, we as a human being, we almost, each of us, we're totally different from others about uh, what is good. So the, the translation, of course, you bring the character to, into the translation. Thank you for the question. I, mean, I was I was really struck by the examples that you gave um, and the, the the different choices that the students made. And I mean, and it's it's you know it's familiar to me just from looking at different professional translations of works. It's like the ones that you showed that were you know were done by people who were very accomplished translators and linguists and language people. So um, I, I was I, I just wanted to say that I was after listening to Japanese recording and then listening to you read the Chinese. I want to sit here all day and listen to Japanese and Chinese poetry in the original language. It's so beautiful. It doesn't matter if I don't understand it. <laughs> I can't take credit for that, but I'll say thank you anyway. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you so much.